So today I'm joined by Flo Broderick, who's the Chief Marketing Officer of Carto. Flo, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Deck. So let's just kick off with a question about Carto. So it might not be a familiar name to many people, but it should be. So tell us, what problem do you solve? So Carto is a location intelligence platform, which doesn't mean a lot to some people, but basically it's all about asking questions about where things happen and why they happen in those locations. So if you think about retailers, for example, imagine that you need to open five McDonald's in a new area of the UK next year. You need to decide where makes most sense based on foot traffic, based on weather patterns, based on proximity to other types of establishment, basically helping different enterprise companies to ask those questions and reduce costs and increase revenues by making good questions, by answering questions about where. Okay, well, let's let's just dig into that a little bit more then, Flo. Talk to us about some of the challenges that your, your customers face and how Carto helps them. So retail site selection, which I just mentioned, is one of them, but there are lots of others. Um, for example, we work with CPG companies, um, so the big uh, consumer packaged goods companies out there, FMCG for those in the UK, uh, to understand things around customer segmentation, for example. Where do you need more points of sale? Uh, for example, if you consider ice cream sales, obviously that's closely linked to weather and what weather looks like in certain locations and how tourism patterns are recovering or not after a mm. pandemic. Um, or another example is logistics, which is obviously a really high growth one because during the pandemic, so many people started shopping online who wouldn't have otherwise shopped online. Uh, and so there's a massive stress on the supply chain to deliver so much more to our homes right now. There's also the added stresses of what's going on with supply chain in Brexit, for example, in Europe. Um, and so helping customers optimize their operations geospatially so that they can uh, reduce the number of routes, uh, reduce their carbon footprint, for example, and be far more efficient in the way that they run their last mile operations. Well, let's just talk about that then exactly. And because obviously you mentioned um, obviously what's been happening over the last 18, 24 months, etc. But I remember when we were speaking previously to this call, you mentioned that events used to be a large part of your kind of go to market strategy. And obviously, with the lot, what's happened in the last couple of years, so obviously, that's actually changed significantly your your GTM. So what what have you done now? How have you how have you pivoted? Yeah, so uh, from a content perspective, at the beginning, it was really important for us to, to adapt to, to what our customers and prospects were seeing. Um, so we actually, you know, the, the pandemic was closely linked to where things were happening, where were their cases, where were their restrictions. And so we had a lot of customers come to us with use cases around, OK, we need to see how mobility patterns are recovering, how, are, how is mobility changing during lockdowns, etc. So we, we actually launched a grants program um, and we gave out free Carto accounts to many government institutions and many non-for-profits so that they could start actually getting the benefit. You know, we were all in a terrible situation and so many people were suffering in our company outside of work. And we just wanted to help. So one thing we did was launch that grants program, um, which gave us loads of fantastic content to tell great stories about why geospatial data was more important than ever. Um, so that was one initiative that we did. But in terms of actually demand generation, how did we adapt? Um, one of the biggest initiatives and most successful ones for us during the pandemic was a virtual our own virtual event. We didn't have as much success participating in virtual events run by uh, other companies who went mm. from offline to online. But we moved our own conference, which is called the Spatial Data Science Conference, uh, online. Um, we did it with Hopin. Uh, we had uh, about 6,000 to 8,000 signups for each one of the three events that we did. Um, we also did so, a couple of verticalized versions of that, one focusing on retail and CPG, one focusing on financial services. The other one is vertical agnostic. Uh, and the key to the success of that is we don't make that about Carto. We don't make that into a user conference at all. We really make that about bringing together people working in data science who deal with geospatial data to come together, talk about their use cases, talk about the types of data that they're using and to share their best practice. Um, and so we kept the presentations really short, 15 minute rapid Q&A afterwards. Nobody wants to sit on, on a Zoom call and, and listen to 30 minutes presentations, I think, in the current uh, climate. Mm. Um, and that just worked really well. I think we had about 500 to 1,000 people on live at any one time. We also gear the whole thing up to be very Netflix in the, in the sense that people want to watch things when they want to. They don't want to watch it live. Um, so we really gear up on demand, get the videos available online as fast as possible. 
And, and the fantastic thing about a virtual event like that is you have this amazing playlist of content afterwards, which your SDRs can use, your account executives can use, your CSMs can use to nurture accounts. Um, and so that was really a massive lead driver for us uh, over the past couple of years. And, and and what was the result then? I mean, can you share anything with us about how that actually turned out and what kind of results you had? Yeah, I mean, we've had plenty of opportunities off the mm. back of that event. Um, it's been a, a revenue driver. It's not, it's, and it's been much faster than offline events. Sometimes with opportunities that come from offline events, it's six months later, a prospect says, oh, yeah, I, I saw that you guys were at Big Data London and uh, we had this RFP and so you came to mind. It's actually been much more immediate because they they see those use cases at the conference follow up uh, and so our sales team move the, the conversation forwards. And mm. it's very easy to communicate the use case via a conference like that. So really great impact um, in that respect. The, the other thing that we did that, were, that we had time to think about, particularly at the beginning, when it was very unsure what was going to happen with many deals, with purchasing departments, you know, so much froze. And we were very worried. We thought verticals like retail, this is this is bad news. But actually, because there's such a paradigm shift happening in retail, there's more questions than ever about, OK, well, if we're going to close 20 of our stores in central London, um, how are we going to do that? Which ones? And if we're going to go to curbside pickup, because that's what we have to do during a pandemic, how are we going to do that? Actually, uh, the leads grew uh, in some of those verticals. So uh, it was a surprise, but the thing that we had time to do was to really improve our sales stack. Um, mm. So we were we moved across to outreach, for example, and that's been a massive boost in terms of productivity for our sales development team. We started using Gong and doing a lot more call coaching because uh, you know that that was a, a really great vehicle remotely onboarding new salespeople. You're not in the office with them. You're not having the chance to visit other offices. And so we started doing a lot more cool coaching to understand how we were talking about different use cases, how we were doing solution selling, giving the feedback to, to those starting off in that team. And we started doing more digital experiments with intent data, with G2. Um, and it was a really interesting learning curve for us. Well, it certainly seems that you've had a very, very busy last couple of years um, trying new things out and obviously learning an awful lot as well, right? Absolutely. Learning an awful lot. Um, everybody in our team has, I think, and, mm -hmm. um, much like any discipline within marketing, whether that's SEO, uh, whether that's demand gen, um, you only learn by experimenting and you're never mm -hmm. really up to date. Uh, however many years you've had in the industry, um, you know, I, I'm part of a community, for example, called Pavilion, um, and I am involved in the channel there to kind of read what are other marketers trying out. And, you know, lots of conversations about things like events and yeah. we've shared polls of, OK, well, the smaller events are working for us with 30 people rather than going to the trade shows. And being able to participate in that and see those ideas has been really helpful during the pandemic. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you there about Pavilion. And also I'm a member of Peak Community, which was started by Sangram Vajri. And that's also very similar as well. Lots of sharing and lots of very kind of selfless kind of um you know, advice really, and people really going out of the way to help other marketers and other other CMOs. So let's just talk about 2022 then. Obviously, there's some kind of semblance of normality returning, albeit that, you know, the last couple of weeks have um, have suggested that maybe that normality won't come as quick as we thought. But what does um, your marketing look like in 2022? Um, so it's a good question. And I think it's going to be more localized than ever because it's such a different um, situation in the US, for example, to the UK until recently. Mm. Um, and then other markets across Europe, Germany, France, Spain, there are massive differences between each one in terms of where our buyers are at. You know, and it's so linked to what's happening and what's appearing on, on the news every day um, that we have to be very fast to adapt. <clears throat> it did feel like we were having a semblance of normality until everything kicked off this week, really, with Omicron. Mm. Um, we had a, a very rigorous schedule plan for 2022 around events, um, getting back to those offline events and speaking to our buyers in person because it's been so long. And I think the and we we saw this in Q4, particularly in the UK, that because people have been so long without going to um, events and trade shows, people were desperate to get back. Um, that's a lot slower in North America. So um, we're going to have to be very cautious about how we plan. Like this, I wouldn't be committing budget for events in Q2, for example, because mm. you just don't, don't know yet what it's going to look like. So 
more digital experience in Q in experiments in Q1 until we know what the situation is like. Um, more and more outbound prospecting. We've spent a lot of time and resource on upskilling in outbound and mm. working out how we do that in an educational, useful way to our buyers rather than uh, spray and pray, et cetera. Um, and that's yielding some great results. But one of the biggest uh, bets for us is our is our partner marketing um, and really leveraging some of our uh, strategic partners like Google uh, as channels because they obviously have a direct line to so many accounts and a really strong, large sales force that we can work very closely mm. with. Well, that actually leads nicely flow into my next question. Actually, I was going to ask you around channel marketing and partner marketing. Obviously, this is a huge part of your of your go-to-market strategy uh, with partners such as Amazon Web Services, Google that you mentioned, uh, Snowflake, etc. Let's let's dig into that a little bit more if we, if we may. Um, talk us through what's different about building relationships with um, with channel partners versus direct clients. Yeah, it's very different in the sense that. Uh, when it's direct, you're speaking to a technical buyer in many cases, in in, in Carto's case, because we sell to data scientists, developers, mm. analytics profiles, generally speaking. There are some standalone cases where we sell to business people or we sell a solution. Um, but there, we're, we're talking about how our platform can connect to their existing stack. What are the use cases? What data streams can we provide via our platform? And so that could be a customer like a Coca-Cola, uh, Bain are customers. Um, another good example would be MasterCard or Vodafone. Uh, so you're speaking directly to them, directly to departments with a business need. When we're talking to our partners, you know, all of those customers I've just mentioned are moving to the cloud, are already multi-cloud using data warehouses. Um, so for us, it was just a very natural evolution to make our platform the go-to cloud-native platform for mm. geospatial. <clears throat> uh, some of the existing competitors in the market have not been very effective at going cloud native. And so it's become a real com competitive differentiator for us. So when we talk to those partners, really, it's about understanding what are their drivers, um, how are they structured, and then giving them things in a box, uh, a campaign in a box. Mm. Um, but then you can't expect an account executive at Google to know how to sell into every single subcategory of SaaS. So how do you very quickly give them everything they need to talk about geospatial analytics to one of their accounts? Um, and how are they comped at the end of the day? You want to understand what's their comp structure? What is it that drives them to end up speaking about you instead of one of the other eight partners that are trying to talk to them um, to their final customer? And so you have to show the upsell value, the cross-sell value, um, and make it very clear what the use cases are. Ask them to map out their accounts. Maybe they manage eight accounts. Explain for these CPG customers, it's best to talk about point of sale strategy, customer segmentation. For these retail customers, let's talk about site selection and geo marketing, and just make it very clear to them. Give them the materials, give it uh, on a plate, uh, one pages, decks, videos, uh, etc., and that really helps uh, them to move deals forwards and for us to create opportunities. Yeah, I mean, we do something very similar with kind of sales playbooks for our clients and for the sales team within, within our clients. And just really, as you said, give it to them in, on a plate, in a box, making it very simple for them to understand and for them to digest. And and ultimately, they they want to sell and they're, they're keen to sell the right solution. That's the right solution for their clients, right? So we're, if you can help to, um, to transmit that message across and make it easier for them, then obviously that will accelerate the sale. Um, talking about accelerating, would you say that these, these relationships, these partner relationships have really been a growth accelerator for Carter? Absolutely. Um, in multiple ways. Mm. In one sense, because it brings us more leads because our prospects see, oh, great, Carto connects natively to Snowflake and mm. Google BigQuery. Uh, and then on the other side, because their sales teams become an extension of our sales teams and mm. they talk about us and we generate buzz within Google uh, and our other partners. And so it's it's been an accelerator on all fronts, really. Um, mm. And it's something we intend to in, invest a lot in in 2022 and extending that across the other clouds. Um, and I really do believe it's it's going to be a massive demand driver for us. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, when we were talking previously, Flo, that you do quite a lot of uh, kind of joint kind of co-marketing um, with these partners. Um, <coughs> Are there any kind of caveats to doing that or any any kind of insight you can give? Yeah, I think the most important thing is you have to be proactive um, and you need to have a great partner manager on, on your side who introduces you 
to the right people in marketing. Mm. At the end of the day, you know, I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands of requests to do co-marketing each day in a company like Google Cloud or Snowflake. Mm. Mm. So you really need a partner manager who's going to be able to tell your story and be at the table to put forward your webinar idea, your white paper idea. Um, so you need to find those great people within those companies that they're going to make it happen for you. Um, and then I think if you're, uh, you're looking to find those opportunities, be outboundish about it as marketeers. Outbound just isn't, isn't just for salespeople. Outbounds for marketeers. Reach out to the partner manager, partner marketing managers. Reach out to the demand generation people at partners and give them it as it should be. You know, give a, give a campaign plan, give the idea, talk about what's the potential revenue that you can drive, how many leads can you create, how many opportunities will come. And, and I think they'll, they'll understand the business case for working with you. Okay, that's very, very, very good advice there. So let's just talk about something which I know you're you're passionate about. Um, obviously, the market is is white hot at the moment in terms of people moving, uh, people looking to, um, to to change jobs. The the market you know, for B two B marketers, for ABM marketers, etc. is 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 probably never been as active as it is at the moment. Um, and I think when we were talking previously, you you were saying that um, there doesn't seem to be enough good SaaS marketers out there and one of the things that you're passionate about there at Carto obviously is is growing talent internally so could you talk to us a little bit about that and and what kind of program you have there absolutely I think there is a massive shortage of b2b marketing talent um, and it's even worse in some countries and others you know in Mm. North America there's a massive SaaS ecosystem Uh, people actually move around a lot more and because so many people have raised money Founders, the first thing they do is they are, they're throwing a lot of money at marketing, raise brand awareness, drive demand. That, that's what they want to do. Um, and so it is a very active market and it's very important to be able to attract the best marketing talent. So something we always try and do is we keep a, try and keep a talent pipeline within Carto and train people in, internally. Um, so we always have a couple of marketing interns. We all, We then... We never keep interns on beyond six months. If they're, they're fantastic, we transition them to a marketing associate role. Uh, sometimes we get them to specialize in something in particular, whether that's product marketing, demand gen, uh, events marketing. Um, so we try and make it a factory for talent, the same way that we manage our SDR team as well. You know, mm. um, I, I think nowadays being a great salesperson is about being extremely curious, being diligent and being able to answer a customer's questions. Uh, and that's a big part of the qualification process. So we don't really hire any SDRs that have previous SDR experience. We hire those capabilities and those uh, cultural capabilities, mm. and competencies, um, and we develop them and we give them a lot of training. Uh, we bring in some of those expertise externally. Um, so, for example, we, we work um, with, with an outbound coach. We also work uh, with a, de- a de- marketing automation experts externally. Mm to really bring in those skills, which are difficult to find in the market. Um, And and it's working pretty well for us. You know, several of our SDRs have become account executives, uh, several have become customer success managers, and some have even gone into marketing. Um, But yeah, there's an absence of that that great marketing talent. And I think every founder wants to hire a a make money marketer, not a make it pretty marketer. Um, And getting those marketers who can speak the language of sales who understand what the sales cycle looks like, know how to handle objections, mm. know how to uh, really drill into what the ICP is looking for and understand the industry that they're selling to. It, it's tough to find. Um, and those things are difficult to pro- probe for as well in interview processes, but I think we've got a, a quite a good method for doing that. Um, but yeah, I think it's a big part of what we do at Carto and we try and... Um, have a very uh, strong performance management system. So we give lots of feedback. We use a great tool internally called Nailted to give mm. feedback and see how employees are feeling and what they want to learn more about. Um, and we give big opportunities to people if they're bringing a lot to the table. We don't uh, we don't care necessarily about they've got six years experience in this or they've got, you know, sometimes the rock stars on paper are not necessarily the people that drive your business to do incredible things. And you have you have to bet on people in, in scale up and startup land. And that's what we do. And there's some really great stories of, you know, our, our VP product, as an example, started as a customer success manager four and a half years ago and is now yeah running the whole product team and is a really fantastic uh, part of the team. 
Same thing, an SDR intern became a sales director in four years. Uh, I really love those stories. No, they're great stories. And I think um, we, we do something similar in the agency where we have an internship system as well program. And, and many of our many of our team now, our full-time employees rather, have come through that kind of internship as well. So we're, we're, we're very similar to yourselves flowing that kind of investment. Um, so let's just, oh, so this, this podcast is called Let's Talk ABM. But let's just talk a little bit then about your ABM program there. Can you, can you paint us a picture of what your ABM program looks like? Absolutely. So... Um... As you may have guessed from the topics we discussed today, we are pretty much vertical agnostic in terms of what comes in inbound at Carto because mm. geospatial is such a cross-industry thing. You've got telecoms, utilities, cities, governments, healthcare. It's really wide-ranging, but that's really difficult as a marketer. Uh, you know, it's a lot of industries to touch. It's also a lot of buyer personas that I mentioned earlier. You know, data scientists, developers, analytics. Sometimes we speak to CTOs if it's scaling companies. It's very varied, which you know, compared to some SaaS companies that are very clearly targeting one vertical mm. and maybe two job titles, that's a challenge. And so we've made a really concerted effort to just focus on accounts in three particular industries, which I mentioned at the beginning, retail, CPG and logistics. Um, the use cases are really clear. We've got fantastic customer stories there. Um, and so our, our ABM program is, is all about getting our marketing and sales team to row in the same direction towards the same accounts, which are our named accounts for North America and rest of the world. We organize our sales teams in pods. Um, so each pod has three or four account executives and has two or one SDR, depending on the size of the pod, who work together with them to target those accounts. And we use a, ser a series of tools to get insights on those accounts. Uh, so we use Zoom Info, we use Lusher for contact information, but we also use scoops from Zoom Info to understand what's happening inside those accounts. And what we do for each of those accounts is really plan out, okay, what are the potential use cases? Um, what is happening in that account that means that they're going to ask some big where questions in the next year? So if you think about an account like um, Amazon, mm. how many distribution centers are they going to be opening across the US? What are the problems going to be around those distribution centers? Is it going to be access to motorways? Is it going to be access to talent? Because that's one of the biggest problems that distribution centers have is actually how do they find people in the area who are going to staff them? Um, is it that Amazon are going to launch in a completely new category that they're going to need loads of data around uh, plant-based and vegan activities by location? You know, we really try and map out what data sets, what use cases could be useful per account and be as personalized as we can in our messaging to that. And of course, all of the marketing that we do around that, one pages, blog posts, webinars, videos, uh, we, we try and align them with those use cases uh, and the things that are happening in the markets. Like another great example is we're seeing this massive boom in quick commerce. Mm. So 15 minute deliveries to your home uh, or um, delivery food delivery apps and ghost kitchens and ghost stores. Um, so making sure that we've got content on that, uh, that we can point customers to, to enable that credibility when we speak to those accounts. No, it's incredible. Just what you mentioned there about that kind of, 15 minute delivery etc i mean I, I live up in the mountains so I, I i wish i ever could, i could have like you know that kind of delivery here but um, that's just wishful thinking but obviously if you live down in the city somewhere in madrid barcelona or london i'm sure that um that's coming to you very soon if it's not already there um let's just talk about a couple more questions around abm um from your experience Flo, what do you think is the hardest thing about doing abm I think the hardest thing is to make sure that everybody rows in the same direction and there are no mm. distractions. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes we'll see a lead come inbound and it will turn into a really big opportunity and it will be a use case that's not necessarily one of our core use cases, but we get very excited about it and think, okay, well, let's replicate that rather than sticking to the use cases in accounts that we've defined. And so I think sellers, you know, sometimes we'll think, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to outbound into telecoms, which is not what we planned. Um, so trying to help the entire organization understand, okay, well, all of this marketing spend and resource that we're plowing into these use cases and these accounts, if you suddenly go off in that direction, it's not going to pay off. And it's, it's, it's like training for a marathon. Um, and I think sometimes people want to jump off and do cross CrossFit instead of doing the marathon. Um, and that's, that's the challenge. And the best way to deal with that is very strong communication. And when we have our, our global sales calls, we try and explain these are the initiatives we're doing. 
these are the results that we're seeing. Um, so let's all try and keep rowing in the same direction. But that's that is a big challenge, especially when you've got so many people joining the sales organization all the time. You know, we're hiring a lot at the moment. Mm. Uh, and making sure that that vision is communicated to everybody that starts out is is really important. No, that's a good one. I mean, obviously, we often talk about ABM being a marathon, and I've, I am not a sprint, but I, I've never seen the kind of the the opposite referred to as a kind of CrossFit trainer. But I think it's a very very visual uh, um, uh, metaphor, really. Um, let's just uh, two final questions, just to just to finish off on flow. Um, you've talked about the hardest thing about ABM, but if you know. You get a phone call from a friend. It's last thing in the evening. You're about to shut down your laptop. And then a, a friend calls up and says, hey, Flo, they've asked me to, to launch an ABM program and I need some advice. What is that one piece of advice that you give them? I would say don't neglect content. I think some people think that when you're starting off an ABM strategy, it's OK, well, I'm going to invest in the tools. Uh, mm. That's what I need to do. I need to go and buy some software. But what's the point in buying software to do it if you don't have great content and great campaigns to push through those tools? Um, you know, there's so much MarTech out there. Um, and it's very easy to have that MarTech referred within the company. Somebody says, oh, I use this at my old company. Yeah. But there's just no point in making that investment, as with any software, if you're not going to really put the hours into making it uh, making it work. Um you know, and I've seen this with our SDR team. You know, we try, we've tried lots of tools, but I try to only keep X amount of experiments going at one time, one time because it's, it's distracting for people. So it's not all tools and jazz hands. It's about the content. No, it's very good. I think, yeah, I mean, a lot of people get a bit obsessed with the kind of technology. And I think the MarTech vendors and the ABM tech vendors have done a very, very good job in marketing and making people want to learn more about their technology. But ultimately, you've got to get the strategy right first before you can think about technology. And you've got to get the content, as you said, the messaging, the value proposition, all that aligned and nicely teed up before you even start thinking about you know the shiny the shiny baubles so to speak of the technology right and obviously we're coming to the end of 2021 2022 any prediction for abm in 2022 i think it's just going to be cost constant readjustment um you know uh, not in terms of the accounts that we target because like i said it's a marathon but mm. in terms of you know I, it would be very easy to to prepare a 2022 plan um, in previous times. But after a pandemic, when things change so quickly that affect our buyers, we have to adapt with that uh, and we have to keep taking temperature um, and in each country because it looks so different from country to country. Um, so we're not through this pan pandemic changes of direction yet. Um, and so in terms of preparing my budget for, for ABM and all things demand gen for the new year, I have left a lot of contingency um, mm. and not tried to set too much in stone because we need to be agile in, in adapting to our customers' needs. That's um, a very, well, let's see if it, if it comes true. But obviously, I think agility is going to be really important, I think, as you mentioned, and the ability to to, to kind of move and change quickly as as because we, we didn't know what was going to come, come you know, down the pipe two years ago. So I think trying to um, be prepared is probably a very, very sensible thing to do. Flo, thanks so much for, for, for sharing some insight around Carto and your, your ABM journey. And uh, I wish you and the team there every success for the future. Thanks very much, Dick. Great to chat with you. Thank you.